Hello, everyone. This is uh, Nairi from Low Carbon Fasting. Um, our guest today is the author of the book, Ravenous. Now, the full title of the book is Otto Warburg, The Nazis, and the Search for the Cancer Diet Connection. Um, welcome to Low Carbon Fasting, Sam Apple. Thank you. Happy to be here. How would you like me to refer to you, Mr. Apple, uh, Sam? Uh Yes, Sam, it's great. Sam is great. Okay, uh, so the book was first published in uh, 2021. So, um, and I'm uh, lucky I actually purchased the Kindle version and just finished reading it. In fact, I finished it just yesterday, the last oh, wow. three chapters. Um, so, Sam Apple, you, uh, you, you, have a, you, you call yourself a journalist, but you, you have a background in writing, but you have a background in science as well. So you're the perfect candidate to have written a book that includes not only biography. Well, it is a biographical book of Otto Warburg, the great uh, scientist, Nobel Prize winning scientist, but it also um, combines history, science, and almost reads, reads almost like fiction. <laughs> it's a grouping, you wouldn't want to put the book down in back. Um, so what is your professional background for um, those of, uh, you know, those people in the audience who may not have heard of you? Sure, uh, I'm a writer by, by training. I uh, studied English literature and creative writing as an undergraduate student. And um, I did take some science courses, but that was not my focus. And uh, then I did a, uh, a master's uh, degree in, in writing, an MFA in writing uh, after college. And uh, since, you know, after that, I worked for many years as a journalist writing about different topics. Uh, I did not think of myself as a science journalist, but uh, one of my books is called American Parent. And I was writing about my experience, you know, raising my newborn son. And I became very curious about um, all the different parenting practices and whether or not they were actually valid scientifically and where they came from. And so I think that was the start of my science journalism career in a way. But um, at the time, I, I hadn't been particularly interested in, in nutrition, uh, but uh, I became, you know, I, I reached my 30s and was not in great shape. And I became curious about what was going on. And I began reading more. I came across the works of Gary Taubes, and that, that got me very interested in nutrition. And uh, I just started, you know, sort of started reading more and learning more and, and sort of gradually became a, a science journalist. And now I teach in the uh, science writing program at Johns Hopkins University. Yes, you're a faculty member there. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, on your social media uh, platforms. Um, so what inspired you to write this particular book about Otto Warburg? Well, how, how did it come about? Uh, sure. Um, it was, you know, really an interest in, in metabolism that, that started things off and interested in low carb nutrition, you know, like many, many people, probably many people in your audience. Uh, I grew up thinking dietary fat was the worst thing in the world and ate, you know, only low fat and skim milk. And, and so I was very surprised to, to see that the scientific underpinnings of, of that science, um, you know, were much weaker uh, than I, than I would have ever dreamed. And, you know, given how significant that is, it was really a shock to me. Um, but I didn't want to, you know, Gary Taubes and Nina Teichels and many others have written interesting books on this. I didn't want to do something that somebody else had already done. And um, I was fascinated by the cancer connection in particular because, you know, other diseases sort of intuitively, it made sense to me that they were connected to metabolism, but I had really truly believed that cancer was a separate realm. You know, I guess I knew that obesity had been linked to cancer, but I had never really stopped and, and thought that through. So I, I just thought cancer is, you know, an unlucky mutation or, you know, sun exposure or smoking, but it never occurred to me that, you know, every bite of food you eat in theory, you know, could be a part of this story as well. Uh, so that was really a shock to me. And then I wanted to think about, you know, how do I tell this story? How do I dig into it? And I came across Otto Warburg and, you know, as a journalist, as a storyteller, I'm always in search of a good character and, you know, he's a great character, not necessarily a great person, but a great character. <laughs> he certainly is a great character. And uh, well, um, so, you, so the title, talking about the title, Ravenous, 
obviously meaning sort of constantly hungry, insatiable. And you're talking about the um, cancer cells. Yeah, well, having this insatiable hunger for um, particularly glucose. But what, I mean, you'll comment on that um, in a minute. But what I also love is that Otto Warburg's character is also ravenous for recognition, for status, for, uh, for power. Yeah. Would you, would you comment on that? Well, I'm glad you picked up on that. I don't know how many people did, but I, I really thought it was a title that that worked on many different levels, uh, you know, speaks, you know, first and foremost to the cancer cells, as you mentioned, you can think of it in terms of, you know, Warburg being ravenous for fame and power. And then of course the Nazis were, were ravenous in, in their own way. So it, it works on, on different levels. Although I, I admit that it, it actually wasn't my first choice for a title. I wanted to call it a, uh, a disease of civilization because I thought that could also work at multiple levels. You know, cancer was called a disease of civilization, although that, that's now kind of a racist, outdated term. Now you would say, you know, a disease of modern industrialized world. But, you know, I thought you could also talk about Nazism as a disease of civilization and ideological disease. I thought that worked on both levels as well. But my publisher said that that title was too heavy. <laughs> uh, so I gave up on that battle. Well, perhaps for the better, because, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm sure they were right. <laughs> equally, diabetes is also called, type 2 diabetes, called um, uh, disease of civilization. I also heard recently of um, different forms of dementia being called disease of civilization. Yeah. So that yeah. would have been a very sort of much more broad. Yeah, term, yeah. No, the, the publisher has learned not to listen to me. They're probably smart about that. <laughs> um, Okay, so what was Otto Warburg's? We'll talk about his upbringing, etc. But before we do that, what was his original hypothesis? Very early on, he realized that cancer cells had a different metabolism. So would you comment on that, all the scientific yeah. sort of information? Yeah, that, that was really, you know, the key discovery, which he made, you know, all the way back in 1923, which was that, you know, cancer cells took up nutrients in a you know, dramatically different way from, from other cells, from healthy cells. Uh, they were taking up much more glucose than other cells that, that were not growing in this way. And, and rather than uh, burning the glucose with oxygen in the mitochondria, you know, these so-called power stations of our cell, they were instead fermenting it, you know, taking the glucose up very rapidly and sort of a, a quick way of processing nutrients. You just split the glucose in two and, you know, attach some hydrogen, send it out of the cell in, in the form of lactic acid. And, you know, the fermentation process is identical, you know, to, to what the microorganisms do. You know, some produce alcohol, some produce lactic acid, but, um, you know, it was really a striking finding that the cancer cells were behaving in this way. And, you know, one of Warburg's first comments was, you know, what he really discovered is that the cancer cell behaves much like a yeast. So he presented his first paper in 1923, and I, so you mentioned 1923. So, um, and that was where he first published and presented it, I think, in, uh, in the United States. And that probably gave him recognition um, and also secured a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation. Yeah, yeah. So he made, you know, one of the incredible things about him is that, you know, he made discoveries in many different areas. And in fact, his Nobel Prize, which he won in 1931, wasn't even for his cancer research. He should have won it for his cancer research, but instead they gave it to somebody else who made a, a discovery that turned out to be entirely wrong. Uh, but then uh, maybe they felt bad about that and uh, they recognized Warburg in 1931 for his um, discovery of the final stage of respiration, the final stage of how a cell uses oxygen to generate you know, ATP and energy. Um, and um, he, he did present those findings in the United States uh, in, in 1929, I believe it was, and, and the Rockefeller Foundation was so impressed that they you know, gave him money to build an institute in Germany. And one of the striking things about that is this, it's not that long after World War I and you have an American institute you know, volunteering to you know, help rebuild German science. So um, you know, it's, it's pretty incredible that that happened. Um, yes, 1921. Um... It was 1921, um, but Germany was uh, 
even before uh, before the 1900s, um, uh, you know, in the late 1800s, Germany was uh, one of the world's leading sort of science bases. There were world leaders in scientific research, and you yep. would have found many sort of leading uh, scientists residing in Germany. Um, now Otto Warburg's father himself was a scientist. So what, how, how, how did that influence, how did his upbringing and the home environment shape him as a scientist? Yeah, no, that, that was a huge part of his background. He, um, his father was a very prominent physicist, uh, had a chair in physics at the University of Berlin, which you know, was very unusual for somebody of Jewish heritage to, to attain that level of success. And uh, he was very close with Einstein and Max Planck and, and other titans uh, of German science. And, and they absolutely were, were dominant in, in science. You know, all the, you know, famous names and Fritz Haber were regular people in Warburg's childhood home. And so I, I believe he truly grew up just assuming that he was going to make great scientific discoveries. And, and the only question in his mind was, what would be the world changing discovery that I make? And he decided on cancer, not necessarily because he had a personal connection, but because it was one of the few areas where the Germans were making no progress. You know, they were making tremendous progress in physics and in, against in medicine, against bacterial diseases. Robert Koch had changed the world by identifying the microorganisms that were responsible, you know, for all these diseases. But cancer, meanwhile, was growing more and more common, and it was, you know, it's creating something of a panic in, in the German world. <laughs> You do give some interesting statistics <laughs> from around the world at that time in the late 1800s, how uh, fast cancer was growing as a disease. Yeah. Um, and um, is this, you mentioned the San Francisco study. Yeah, it, yeah. It was probably one of the largest studies at the time. Can you yeah, talk more about it? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the study you're referring to, I think that was one of the Frederick Hoffman studies. Is that what you're referring to? Yes, yes. It's interesting that this um, American uh, insurance statistician, Frederick Hoffman, uh, actually became the world's authority on cancer statistics and, and, and the statistics of many other diseases. And it became apparent to these people because if you work in insurance, you keep track of what people are dying from. You start seeing you know, more and more people dying of, of cancer and it becomes this big debate, you know, why is this happening? Is it possibly that people are living longer lives? Is it possible that we find a new way of diagnosing this? So it's controversial, but, you know, many people have looked into it and it seems, you know, to me at least, you know, indisputable that cancer actually was becoming more and more common uh, at the time and then throughout the 20th century. And so these studies, you know, they started doing surveys of, you know, including the San Francisco study that you're talking about, uh, you know, just collecting cancer statistics and, and trying to uh, conduct surveys about, you know, what, how people lived prior to getting cancer and to see if they could, you know, make any inferences about, you know, what, what caused the disease. And, and Frederick Hoffman, who looked into this more than, than anybody who's ever lived probably, uh, became absolutely convinced that it, that it was diet that, that was the main determinant. It was fascinating for me because, uh, you know, as early as the, uh, you know, early 1900s, they established that there must have been a connection between diet and, um, and cancer because they couldn't find it in indigenous populations. Cancer yeah. was almost non-existent in, in the indigenous populations. Yeah. So they did call it a uh, disease of uh, civilization. Yeah. No, I mean, in, in fairness, I mean, you make a good point, but in fairness, the fact that it clearly arose, you know, I think it's indisputable that you had these indigenous populations where there was no cancer. And then in the industrial world, you see the cancer. So clearly something about that transition, um, you know, is, is responsible, but it doesn't mean it's diet, but, the, but I, I believe the best evidence, you know, there are other things that change as well, but I think the diet is the most obvious one. Yeah, I think in the starting from the 1920s, they were also looking at connection between uh, environmental factors right. um, other than diet and their connection to uh, to uh, to cancer for example they were looking at toxins carcinogens yeah. um, or, or even fertilizers used to fertilize soil etc so you know when we talk of these things today 
um, we almost take them in as if it's new science and new discovery and something uh, oh absolutely outrageous but they were talking about these things yeah 120 years ago and yet we haven't made that much of a progress or have we in uh, you know in finding a treatment or or even a prevention for for cancer yeah no we've made um you know, shockingly little progress in some respects. I mean, we, we've we've done a very good job in terms of uh, keeping people alive longer with certain types of cancers. And you know, chemotherapy, you know, beginning in the 1950s was you know extremely important innovation. But with with respect to uh, you know the last 50 years, there, there's been much less progress than than people realize. I think and. Um, you know, that's not to take away from the extremely valuable research that's been done or, you know, the great, you know, it's incredible how many people that we can now say that we couldn't. But when you look at prevention and cancer incidence, it's incredibly frustrating to see that we're not making progress in, in that area. And that's despite the fact that we've made a lot of, you know, a lot of gains with respect to smoking. And it's my belief that, you know, it's always two steps forward and then, you know, two, not one step back, but two steps back because, you know, we're not making any progress on the diet part of it. Yeah, another thing that they uh, came up with, um, uh, you know, almost 100 years ago was pesticides um, uh, used in growing produce and they could link it or they suspected it had a close link to, uh, to cancer. And yet we've made absolutely no progress in that in that area either. But but you're right. You mentioned smoking. That's perhaps one area we've sort of almost, not globally perhaps, but at least in Western countries, we've almost won the battle. Yeah, yeah. Now smoking is a definite success story, and it you know gives me hope that um, if we can just you know convince the world that you know certain foods, sugar excess sugar in particular, you know, can be thought of in the way cigarettes can be thought of as, as a cancer risk, then I think we can make progress, but it's very hard to get that message to sink in. So Otto Warburg's um, um, hypothesis, I would call it, that cancer cells um, ferment mm -hmm. more but they shouldn't be do. They should. There shouldn't be that much fermentation going on within a cancer cell if there is oxygen present. Have I understood this correctly? Right. Yeah. Um, That's exactly. So that right. was the puzzle, and he 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 went on for decades trying to understand why cancer cells are actually involved in more fermentation, or they are fermenting more when actually oxygen is present. Yeah. So. Um, so what part of his hypothesis was he able to prove at the end? And what part was actually proven wrong? Yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. What, what's known today as the Warburg effect is when a, a cell ferments, even though oxygen is available, you would expect uh, this shift to fermentation to occur if oxygen you know, can't be used or is unavailable. You know, I refer to it as a backup engine. And, the best example of this is, you know, during strenuous exercise, uh, if your cells can't keep up with demand by the normal energy processes, they'll start to ferment some of that glucose to make up for the energy demand. So it's supposed to be like an emergency thing, but Warburg saw cancer cells were doing it even though oxygen was available. So he thought this, that it is the key to cancer in his mind is this shift to fermentation. And he tried to figure out over the course of his life, why it was happening because he thought if he could figure that out that would explain what what cancer is why cancer is caused and i believe that um he was correct in identifying this shift in metabolism this you know metabolic alteration as the key component of cancer as, as sort of the the starting point but i don't necessarily believe he was correct in, in explaining why it happens his hypothesis was that um a cell would never do this unless there's some sort of damage to the mitochondria, to the power station, because, you know, why, why would you turn on an, a less efficient way of making energy if you have a more efficient way? So his hypothesis was 
that uh, something mechanically is wrong that causes the shift. And I think, you know, maybe we'll go into this more, but, but I, I sort of come down on the side of, of people who are scientists who have suggested that um, it's less about the structural damage in the cell and, and more about the advantages that uh, excess glucose gives the cell in terms of an ability to, to rapidly make daughter cells. Uh, and there's a lot of nuances to this debate because it is true that as cancers develop, they actually do struggle to get oxygen and then they actually do function much like mm. what Rick described. But, you know, I think the key question is what's happening at the earliest stages. That's what we want to figure out. Yeah, and I don't think he was able to figure it out until, you know, uh, um, you know, I don't think he, he, he lived long enough to find out. Yeah, I mean, but I should say there are some scientists working today who continue to believe that Warburg had it exactly right. But I, I sided with the, the majority, I would say, is saying that he got part of, part of it wrong. Yeah, Warburg effect, uh, otherwise known as aerobic glycolysis for the right. scientists in uh, our audience. So we still give him credit for that. And that's, that's a well-known fact. Yeah. So he did leave yeah. a large legacy behind. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it should be said that um, regardless of the explanation, what he found is true that 70% or more of all cancers do this shift to fermentation up and you know that's a hugely important discovery and he apart from cancer made extremely important discoveries in photosynthesis and respiration he crystallized you know just an astonishing number of, of different enzymes i mean he really changed the world of uh, biochemistry uh in the 1920s and 30s in a, in a remarkable way um i'd like us to talk about uh, uh, you know otto warburg's character now in, his, in the historical background the context when uh, you know he was a young scientist was we're looking at germany in the early 1900s um he was uh, of jewish descent he was a yeah. jewish man and uh, he was also homosexual so that <laughs> that um would have put him uh, that would have made him vulnerable for persecution and yet he somehow escaped. Uh, he escaped the, the Holocaust, he escaped persecution at every other level. Um, he even enlisted in the uh, army and uh, we're talking about World War One here. So when, when he was very young, he was enlisted in German um, army. So uh, can, you, can you talk more about that? Was it sheer luck that he escaped persecution at all levels? or was it his courage or um, uh, perhaps even um, arrogance? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think it was a little bit of, of all of those things. Um, you know, he was, his father came from a Jewish family. Uh, his mother was not Jewish, but the name Warburg is a very famous uh, Jewish name, particularly in Germany. Uh, many of his cousins were among the most uh, you know, famous Jewish people in the country. He didn't really practice Judaism in any way. And, and his father actually, like many German Jews, eventually converted to become a Protestant just so he could rise in the university. So Warburg did not have a strong Jewish identity, but everybody knew the name Warburg was Jewish. And um, on top of that, as you mentioned, he had a male partner. Uh, you know, He wasn't openly gay, nobody really was, but they lived together, it was pretty, pretty obvious. So. When the Nazis came along, he was really, you know, in a uniquely dangerous situation because of these two factors. Um, but he did have some other things that worked in his favor. One, he had served in, in World War One in 1933. That still made a difference that you had been uh, a veteran of the war, as many Jews were. But, um, you know, the other thing working in his favor at the beginning was that he had already won the Nobel Prize. He had money from the Rockefeller Foundation. So he was harder to touch than some of the others. And then you know, shockingly, you know, when the Nazis harassed him in 33 and 34, he stood up to them. He you know, chased Nazi inspectors out of his institute. He refused to do the Hitler salute when everybody else was doing it. And originally I thought, you know, when I started to look into the story, I thought, you know, wow, what, a, what an incredible, admirable person. I came to appreciate over the years of research that, you know, what really drove him crazy about the Nazis was that they were telling him what to do. You know, he was so arrogant that the thought that anybody bossing him around telling him what to do was just 
you know, too much for him to bear. So I, I think he didn't leave Germany when many of the other Jewish scientists in his position did because, you know, it looked, it would have looked bad that somebody had chased him away. He wasn't going to stand for that. And so, you know, part of me still admires him for his uh, bravery and the way he reacted to the Nazis. But I did see that, you know, he was so arrogant that, that what was really driving him was his own interest rather than a sort of human, humanitarian drive. It's interesting. He, do, he does mention in uh, one of his letters to his sister, he says uh, he cannot bear the state, the refugee status. So when if he leaves Germany, goes somewhere else, he will not be as, uh, he will not be the renowned Otto Warburg yeah. scientist. He will have to start from scratch. And that refugee status would be too hard for him to, yeah. to, uh, to yeah. bear. The thing that uh, captures Warburg best is, is that conversation where, a similar conversation where he said, you know, another scientist can just go to another country, but it's very hard for a king to find a new kingdom. You know, that's how he thought of himself. And um, it's very surprising, but in the early 30s, the Jews who fled from Germany were looked upon, you know, it was thought to be a shameful thing, like they left in humiliation. Now we look back and think, you know, those were the smartest people in the world, they got out of there. But at the time, it was looked at in a very different way. And Warburg could not do anything that seemed humiliating. You know, he was too proud for that. Um, also, I think he would have had to take his partner with him. So logistically, yeah. it would have been harder. Yeah, um, well, that was, and, yeah. And, uh, and you had to leave your money behind. You know, he, he had gained a lot of wealth. He didn't want to leave that behind either. Um, do you think it was unusual at the time, you did make a reference to that, for the Rockefeller Foundation to have funded a brand new institute? I mean, that was that was quite costly. A spectacular institute for Otto Warburg, which he ran pretty much independently um, in Germany, just following the uh, First World, uh, World War. And what was the, uh, so what, what, what was, um, what were they trying to achieve um, in the Rockefeller Foundation, investing in this Jewish scientist residing in Germany? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it still surprises me that they did that. And they also gave, you know, at the same time, a lot of money uh, on Warburg's request. He requested not only his own institute, but money for a physics institute. So um, they, I think they really believed that the, you know, the World War I era was over and that it was a new Germany, and you know, this is really uh, about a decade after the end of the World War One. And um, you know, they didn't see the Nazi threat coming, and they thought it was time to invest in science. Germany, as you already mentioned, was the leading scientific country. So, you know, if they were going to change, you know, the Rockefellers wanted to cure cancer as much as anybody else. It looked like Warburg would be the person to do this, and uh, it seemed like a good investment. Um, I think they were very embarrassed afterwards. You know, Warburg tried after World War II, he tried to uh, go back to the Rockefeller Foundation and they sort of washed their hands of him because it was embarrassing that they had funded German science in retrospect. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the people that were making these decisions with inside the Rockefeller Foundation were scientists themselves. They knew and admired Warburg and, you know, they knew of his greatness and they wanted to be a part of it, I think. I think there was an expectation that if anyone was going to come up with a cure or a therapy, as you call it in the book, for cancer, it would probably be Warburg. Yeah, I mean, he was certainly a leading candidate. He had made this world changing discovery about the metabolism of cancer cells. He was telling, you know, he was arrogant, so he was telling people that he was going to cure cancer. And there was reason to believe him given the incredible discoveries he had made. Yeah, and uh, I have to mention here that the Germany was the world's the, the, or the world's first international congress of cancer research it was actually held in Germany at this at the time. Um, so that's interesting, you know, to mention. Um, I was also fascinated by uh, the general obsession of of the German population with. Um, germs or eliminating germs with purification with yeah. uh sort of clean living um as early as the 1900s german german authorities were advising women for example to check their breasts for cancer lumps so 
no other country was doing that in my, you know, that uh, as far as I know. Um, would you uh, like to comment on that? This, this is so. This is pre-Nazi Germany, right? Yeah. So the the Germans, you know, as we've already mentioned, were were ahead of the rest of the world in many different sciences, including cancer science. So they were, um, you know, made the first, you know, like twenty years before the rest of the world, the Germans connected smoking to cancer and certain other chemicals to cancer. And, you know, meanwhile, cancer rates were, were getting more and more, um, you know, were, were increasing and increasing. And um, many other diseases have been linked to microorganisms, um, you know, tuberculosis and anthrax and, and on and on. And so, you know, it seemed at the time possible that, that cancer was, was also going to be linked to a microorganism so that they looked into that as well. But, um, you know, the really interesting and kind of problematic and uncomfortable truth is that even during the Nazi era, the Germans made progress in cancer that other countries weren't may, making. And it was partly because the Nazis inherited an, an incredible scientific establishment. And perhaps also because, you know, the Nazis as part of their ideology were obsessed with purity and cleanliness. And, uh, you know, this historian Robert Proctor, who influenced my thinking about this, you know, argued that in, in the Nazi mind, the Jews were just one more sort of contagion. You know, they looked at it as one more impurity and that the whole Nazi project could be thought of as sort of a, a hygienic experiment is the term he used to, to cleanse the body of all impurity. So it's, it's horrific, but it is also true that they made some progress and cancer in, in terms of being extremely motivated to, to purify the body and, and learn about, you know, what possible carcinogens could be in the environment. And the uh, obsession to uh, to find out the causes of cancer or to eliminate cancer, particularly cancer, was probably intensified uh, with uh, Hitler himself. Yeah. Having, yeah. Uh, uh, having uh, this great uh, living his pretty much his whole life in fear of particularly cancer because he lost his mother at the end yeah. of cancer. Yeah, I mean, so Hitler, like Warburg, you know, grew up during this period where cancer was becoming more common and Germans were becoming afraid of it. And then, um, you know, when Hitler was a young man, his mother died of breast cancer. His mother was the only person he was able to connect with, the only person he ever loved, historians say, and he, he was absolutely devastated. Uh, his, the doctor treating Hitler's mother uh, was Jewish, and he later reported that he's never in his life seen anybody more upset than, than young Hitler watching his mother die of breast cancer. And um, Hitler was a hypochondriac, and uh, you know, he worried about many conditions, but he was always obsessed with cancer. And that was probably you know, one of the most surprising parts of my research, just seeing the extent how often Hitler talked about cancer and how much it was in his, his thoughts. And so you know, it's, it's not surprising, you know, the, the connection between Warburg surviving and the Nazi being obsessed with cancer is probably not a coincidence. You can't prove directly that um, Hitler said save him because he's going to cure cancer, but there's a tremendous amount of circumstantial evidence. And, and indeed, um, on the very day that, that Warburg was inside, you know, Hitler's headquarters, you know, hours later, we see that, that Hitler is talking about cancer research and, um, you know, Hitler's top deputies were overseeing Warburg's case and um, Hitler would be involved, you know, in the process where somebody like Warburg was protected by this Aryanization process, Hitler was known to, to oversee these cases. And, um, and there's, there's 10 other reasons, but it's very clear that, um, you know, the Nazis were obsessed with cancer. And I think it's very likely that, that Hitler was uh, involved, although we don't know exactly how that played out. It seemed like that when I was reading the book, uh, because it was very unlikely that he would have, uh, he had many enemies, even from within his own um, institute, it seems. So it was very unlikely that he would have uh, you know, escaped. Um, um, so, so there was this classification of uh, full Jews and yeah. Jews and etc. And he didn't buy any of that. He just said he wasn't a Jew to anyone, yeah. who, any authority yeah. who was questioning his Jewish background. He either refused to provide paperwork or he uh, he just said he wasn't he wasn't a yeah. Jew. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really important point because it's something that I think many people don't understand. I certainly didn't understand it 
until I got into this research that one of the reasons Warburg had an advantage was that he was only half a Jew. You know, it's, it's commonly said that if you had even one Jewish grandparent, then you were a Jew by Nazi standards and you're all treated the same. And it is true that the Nazis planned to eliminate anybody who had one Jewish grandparent. But it's also true that um, during the 1930s, they did, you know, beginning in 1935, they started to make distinctions and half Jews were treated slightly better than quarter Jews. I mean, quarter Jews were treated slightly better than half Jews and half Jews were treated slightly better than uh, full Jews. And, um, you know, in the end, they decided uh, that half Jews like Warburg would be treated like full Jews and that quarter Jews would be more protected. So Warburg ended up on the wrong side of the divide. But I do think that that being only half Jewish helped him survive a little bit longer uh, than he might have otherwise. Um, his sister did leave Germany, though. Yeah, did, yeah, did. yeah, his sister fled wisely. Um, now, I'd like to mention his cousin, Eric Warburg, who um, lived in the United States. Then he came to help or he searched for, uh, for Otto Warburg. Didn't he? And on a number of occasions, he helped him financially. Yeah. Yeah, so he was, you know, Eric Warburg was was part of the famous Jewish Warburg family that, you know, they were bankers in Hamburg and he he left, but then after the war, the, you know, the post-war West German government brought him back to help in the, you know, rebuilding of, of Germany. And, you know, one of his jobs was, you know, to sort of secure German science because both, you know, the Americans and the, the Russians, the Soviets were sort of poaching and, and taking away. And they certainly didn't want Otto Warburg to end up in the Soviet Union. And, and the Soviets were very interested in him. It's clear they, you know, they gave him a Mercedes among other things. Uh, so he, he went to Germany to, to find Warburg and, um, you know, I think helped make sure that he didn't end up in Soviet hands. Interesting. Now, um, when he was enlisted in the, uh in the First uh, World War, enlisted in the army. His family were worried about him. They didn't yeah. like the idea of him serving in the army. They even got um, Einstein <laughs> sending him a letter, I think, or trying to intervene to say, hey, you, you know, we can't lose you as a scientist. The army yeah. is not the right place for you. That's interesting. Yeah, that's one of my favorite Warburg stories. And yeah, the letter still exists, um, you know, his parents wanted him to come back. He wasn't coming back. So, you know, I mentioned that Einstein was a family friend. So they turned to Einstein and got him to, to reach out to Warburg. But what I love is that Einstein's letter was, was written so perfectly that he played into Warburg's vanity, which was exactly the right thing. He said, you're too important to science. That That is an argument that Warburg would hear. Um, so Warburg did come back. And, you know, the war was almost over at that point anyways. But, it, you know, it's possible that Einstein's letter saved his life. But do you also think that uh, the fact that he'd served in the uh, German army in, in the First World War um, gave him some kind of a sense of security that he would perhaps n not be sort of, um, he would be treated differently? Yeah, well, I, I think that I think that's right. And, I, you know, I think that it wasn't just Warburg, you know, when 1933 came around and suddenly, you know, German Jews were, you know, persona non grata, you know, they were no longer welcome in Germany. It was particularly shocking because they had been extremely patriotic, uh, you know, signing up for the war, you know, when they didn't have to, 2% of all German Jews died fighting in World War I. Some German Jews who had actually emigrated to uh, Palestine came back to fight for Germany and they wanted to prove that they were real Germans and, and they were proud to be real Germans. And so when 1933 came along, they you know, was just flabbergasted that they could be treated this way. I mean, Fritz Haber, who you know, was one of the German heroes of World War I, you know, was maybe a villain because he you know, did so much to push forward uh, chemical weapons, but in the German minds, he was, he was a war hero and he just couldn't believe that you know, overnight he was you know, chased out of the country. He died heartbroken a year later. Um, so, you know, it, it's just, you know, it's just an incredible thing for German Jews. They obviously were aware that there was anti-Semitism, but the suddenness of, of the shift was, was still incredible. Um, talking about his Nobel Prize um, mm -hmm. winning ceremony, well, in fact, it was 1926, and he was um, 
he was nominated for the Nobel Prize alongside uh, Fibiger. Oh, yeah. um, and so both of them were to share the prize. And did he actually attend the, the ceremony? And he was uh, hugely disappointed, perhaps even angered, to find out that he was left out. Only Fibiger won the prize and his name was not read. Yeah, I mean, did he actually attend? I, I don't remember that detail, though. Maybe, maybe you're right. But um, what, what's certainly true is that um, you know, it was believed that, that, you know, that if you look at the records, it was a split decision, you know, they, they decided that the award would be shared. And then without any explanation, you know, Fibiger was, was announced and Warburg wasn't. Uh, I never got to the bottom of that mystery. I don't think anybody has, you know, there must be some documents somewhere which explain how, how Warburg was, was left off of that, but I, I, I never got to the answer. That must have hurt his uh, ego, oh, yeah. and he yeah. was very resentful, and he was openly resentful in his letters to his sister, letters to other scientists, he was yeah. very resentful about that fact. Yeah, which led to another classic Warburg line when he finally did get it. His first response was, it's about time. It's about time is what he said. Yes, that was interesting too. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, and that was in 1931, I think he won the... Uh, right, right. Um, we did talk about the Nazi project um, and Hitler's uh, or the Nazi sort of obsession of purif purifying uh, Germany, um, not only on a societal level, but uh, but also uh, purifying, I think, you know, the environment, German environment. I mean, Hitler himself was obsessed. He had his own farm. He grew his food in his own farm. He, uh, he didn't want, uh, you know, pesticides or fertilizers to be used in his farm. So, um, so, so would you say that that also is part of the same ideology of purification, purifying not only this German society, but also purifying the soil, purifying the food. Um, and he, I think, uh, you know, purified his diet or in his mind he did uh, by becoming a vegetarian or a raw vegan. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, per first I should say, which, you know, is self-evident that just because Hitler and the Nazis did something doesn't mean, you know, it's wrong. I mean, even evil people sometimes do the correct thing or have the correct belief on, on one particular area. But, um, you know, it is true that in some cases they took reasonable ideas, like, you know, being concerned about, you know, the wrong kind of chemicals and then took it to an extreme that, uh, you know, w was awful and a, and a reflection of their ideology. Um, so even, you know, they even had, you know, Nazi gardeners and only wanted to grow, you know, certain types of plants that reflected, you know, the superior Aryan, um, you know, agricultural tradition and on and on. I mean, it's all absurd, but that, you know, at the core of some of these ideas, there were, there were reasonable things, you know, being concerned about carcinogens and environmental chemicals is reasonable. They just took it to, you know, a real extreme. But what is, what is really uncomfortable in a lot of ways is that um, in the post-war period, you know, a lot of these ideas continued to flourish and they became more mainstream. And in many ways positive, the whole idea of whole foods started. But when you look back, you see that, you know, unfortunately some of the influential people had been Nazis. And then, you know, after the war, these ideas took on different form and it became sort of uncomfortable for everyone to see, the, you know, the Nazi roots of, of some of these ideas, which again, doesn't mean that they're wrong. You know, many of the environmentalists in the post-war period, or of course, were the opposite end of the spectrum. They, they hated the Nazis more than anything, but, but some of them did have Nazi backgrounds. For me, one of the saddest endeavors, I think, uh, that uh, uh, led by the, by, by the Nazis was uh, the plantations. Uh, I think it all started with the, the, the Dachau uh, plantation where they um, used the wars of uh, pr prisoners of war, uh, the Roma, Jews, homosexuals, anyone who was uh, obviously imprisoned. Uh, to grow uh, plantation, yeah, and uh, and also they did some medical experiments on these people. That was yeah. quite sad. 
but yeah no it, it, it's really an extraordinary thing that you know at these death camps you know side by side they have you know you know organic farms some of the first organic farms and, and they're taking prisoners and, and forcing them to uh to run these farms so it's just a, a incredibly revealing portrait of the Nazi mind, I think, to see these two things side by side. And, you know, and that's why Robert Proctor talks about that, you know, to us, it looks like the most incredible contradiction, but in the Nazi mind, it's all, it's all connected, I think. Um, and um, yeah, yeah, it, uh, it was really shocking to me to, to see that, uh, you know, all these ideas about nutrition, agriculture, and then, you know, seeing them explode use the prisoners and, and the camps to test these ideas. And, uh, you know, the first experiments that they did on prisoners were actually cancer experiments. Yeah, it's interesting because it did, uh, it, it, it was successful, successful project uh, in a sinister way because it started off with a cow, a cow plantation and then 14 other farms were added. Yeah, and yeah. List. yeah. And, um, you know, that's, they were supplying, you know, the SS in, in particular with, uh, you know, a lot of this organic food. Himmler, uh, you know, it was particularly obsessed with the, a lot of these issues, had an agricultural background. Right. Okay. So, um, Warburg did leave Germany. Uh, I think it was, um, after the end of the Second World War, he had a post at the University of Illinois in America, yeah. where he played a particularly difficult character. Yeah. Uh, and of course, it didn't, the post of his visa wasn't re renewed, either that or his uh, post wasn't extended. But tell, tell us more about that. Yeah. He always yeah. used to leave Germany, but he did end up leaving Germany. He didn't like it there. He refused to speak English, even though he was fluent in English. Uh, so t t tell us more about that. Yeah, that, that's one of my own personal favorite parts of the book, because, you know, so much of the book when you're writing about cancer and Nazis is obviously not very fun, but there are some comic episodes, I, I think. And, uh, this is certainly, you know, a more comic episode that, that Warburg, who, you know, thinks of himself as a king, but has nowhere to go after the war. The Americans have actually taken over his institute as part of their, their government in West Germany. And uh, Warburg finally gets an invitation to come to the University of Illinois. And um, the idea is that they're going to settle a longstanding debate uh, about photosynthesis. And it just goes disastrously wrong from the moment he arrives. Uh, you know, there's so many examples, but he insisted that um, the heat not be turned on, even though you know it was winter. So everybody was walking around freezing. He refused to speak English, even though he could speak English. Um, he he. They put his partner Heiss up in a fraternity house. And you have to understand, like Warburg is is the most aristocratic human who's ever lived. The thought of him even stepping foot into a fraternity house just cracks me up. Uh, so, uh, you know, he, he literally drove uh, his host crazy to the point where, you know, these wonderful, generous people were, one of them was just riding in a bus around and around, like trying to, to deal with Warburg. And uh, it went wrong in every way, uh, but he was very lucky that, um, you know, the Americans allowed him to come back and get his institute back. And, and he, he sort of went back to his old way of life in, in 1950. And, um, you know, one of the chilling things about it is that, um, you know, he, sh he didn't really look back, you know, it was five years after the Holocaust, after World War II, and he just kind of proceeded ahead without, you know, with rarely mentioning what had happened in Germany. Had a sense of entitlement. He, uh, didn't he? He, <laughs> he thought, they had to do that for him. They had to provide him with this, and uh, and he loved the good life. He loved the luxury, the the, uh, the aristocratic kind of uh, um, environment. His furniture. He insisted on moving his furniture with him, for example, from yeah, one place yeah. to another. Antique furniture. Um, but yeah, you know, I I actually think that explains a lot about his theories about cancer too. Is he he saw the cancer cell or or any cell and sort of an aristocratic light that respiration with oxygen is the higher level and fermentation is the lower level and fermentation, you know, he also argued, you know, rose earlier in the evolution of a cell. So it was like a lower form of life. And I think that's 
played into how, how he thought about cancer as well. Well, there is a, there is a beautiful um, uh, quote in the book. I'll, I'll read it. Um, and it says, um, Warburg didn't yet have answers, but his path to greatness he knew was hidden inside the cancer cell. <laughs> I just I thought I'd read that quote, and I uh, yeah I think uh, it was uh, one of the most beautiful quotes uh, yeah, in the yeah. in the book. Uh, let's talk about his partner because his partner was more than just his um, homosexual partner. His partner actually assisted him. Yeah. In, in his scientific research. Yeah. Throughout his life. Yeah. What do I we can... know what do we know about him? Yeah, we don't know as much as I would like, and I found it hard, you know, I really searched hard for more information about his partner's background, his family background. It's hard to find, but uh, Jakob Heiss or Jacob Heiss was, was his partner. He also uh, was in World War I, and after the war, somebody sort of recommended to Warburg that they take on Heiss as like a, you know, what they used to call like a houseboy, like a servant. And uh, I think that, you know, the person who recommended this probably knew that they were both likely gay and was making an arrangement. It's hard, it's hard to know for sure. But, you know, from the moment he arrived, they were, they were virtually inseparable. And, um, you know, it's very clear that it was a loving relationship. And, um, you know, after the war, Heiss also became the secretary of the Institute. And uh, they were literally, you know, together all day, all night. And Heiss, you know, baked for him and cleaned for him and really acted like a bodyguard. You know, he would chase the media away when they bothered Warburg. So it was, you know, he was, he was kind of a tough, tough guy. Uh, you know, I talked to some of the people who worked in the Institute and they, they you know, they remembered Heist yelling at them. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I think the most admirable thing about Warburg is that he didn't hide that relationship more. In fact, you know, he would be invited to speak in another country and he would say, well, I'll only do it if you also allow Heist to come along. Uh, so, you know, he was so arrogant that uh, he also didn't worry about being persecuted as a gay man in, in a way that other people might have. Um, so, yeah, no, I think it's, it's a very nice story. And, um, you know, what, one thing that makes me happy is when I went to Germany to do research and I went to, to Warburg's grave, uh, I saw that Heiss was buried, you know, right next to him, which, you know, wouldn't have been an obvious thing to do in, in 1984 when Heiss died. So I was very happy to see that. And in fact, Heiss uh, carried on his legacy after uh, Warburg died at the age of 85, because Heiss was uh, probably over 10 years younger than him. Um, so he, uh, he stayed looking after the Institute uh, until a, uh, an appropriate candidate came right. along to take yeah. over. Yeah, no, it's kind of incredible that Heiss was in that position. He had no scientific training, but I saw from his letters that he actually, you know, by living with Warburg his whole life, you know, he had actually learned a lot of chemistry himself and could talk about the supplies in a fairly sophisticated way. And so they actually put Heiss in charge of finding Warburg's replacement, but um, it didn't go very well. And they eventually, you know, sort of gave up on the idea. And, and now Warburg's Institute is, is actually the archives of the Kaiser Wilhelm Society, which I like, because I think I say this in the book that, you know, now researchers can go there and find you know information about Warburg's enemies and their Nazi past, which he would have liked. <laughs> um, Heiss was um, lo loyal, unbelievably loyal to, oh, yeah, uh, to uh, and defended him, um, defended him throughout his life. Um, yeah. But they also had a dog. <laughs> yeah, oh, they loved dogs. <laughs> you know, that yeah. Warburg, oh, War Warburg himself insisted that they, uh, whenever they moved to, uh, to uh, I think it was Illinois, the first move, that they also moved the dog. <laughs> yeah, they eventually gave up on that, but they were trying to bring the dogs and um, they were, you know, worried about how, you know, the people in Illinois were worried about how they were going to feed the dogs and care for them. And it was a whole disaster. They finally gave up on that, but they absolutely loved dogs. And my favorite picture of Warburg, it appears early in the book, is uh, Warburg posing with one of his poodles. I don't know if you remember that photo. I actually wanted to put that in the cover. That's another thing that they didn't listen to me about. Um, but, um, you know, it was, it was a huge part of their lives, the, the dogs. And, and in fact, at the end of Warburg's life, his, his dog would be driven around in, you know, like a Mercedes limousine with Warburg and sometimes, you know, even just the driver and the dog. He was... Uh... 
extremely loving towards his own sister as well. But the relationship that he had with his own father didn't seem to be that loving, or was it? Yeah. He, he always wanted to outdo his father, I think. He wanted to be a better scientist uh, yeah. than his father. Um, what else was, was going on there? Yeah, it's tricky. Um, I mean, he clearly revered his father. You know, he revered Einstein and his father and saw them as brilliant scientists. You know, his father did some of the experimental work that, that you know, showed Einstein was right. Uh, about light and you know photochemical reactions, uh, but at the same time, you know, as you mentioned, you know, he wanted to outdo his father. You know, he his father played classical music together with Einstein and others, and Warburg gave up music because he saw that he wasn't going to be able to be as good as his father, and he couldn't stand that. And you and you look at their letters, you see tension. You know, Warburg, you know, describing his accomplishments, the father criticizing his handwriting. So it's a lot of like you know classic father son stuff. But, you know, what's interesting to me is that, um, you know, I think Warburg went into the realm of biology because, you know, he saw that he wouldn't be able to uh, do his, his father in the world of physics. And he thought he could take all the ideas of physics and bring them into the world of biology. And that's, that is indeed what he did. You know, he studied cancer through the lens of uh, energy, of course, but, but also, you know, some of his key discoveries were in the realm of photosynthesis, which is really the perfect bridge between the physics of his father and in the biological world. Um, you know, his, his big question was, you know, how many quanta uh, are necessary to, to run photosynthesis? And, you know, that became a, a huge debate. Um, but he also made, you know, really important discoveries with, uh, you know, that, that involved the tools of a physicist in terms of measuring respiration and, and measuring enzymatic reactions. So, his father's influence, I think, can be seen in, in everything he did. So let's talk about, uh, and this is science talk, so let's talk about the question of photons and how they interact with atoms. And I think this whole sort of debate went on for decades and Warburg insisted he was right. So let's talk more yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah, to me, I mean, I, sh I should clarify that this is this area, you know, is outside of my expertise. I mean, I don't know if I have any expertise, but certainly this area is, is outside of my expertise. But, uh, you know, it was one part of Warburg's life, so I did want to include it in the book. But, you know, the, the central question, you know, is really how many photons are, are required to, to power uh, a photosynthesis, a photosynthetic reaction. And, and Warburg thought it was one, and um, others were, were saying that it would require four. And, um, you know, Warburg, um, you know, was convinced it, it was a smaller number because he was also convinced that nature uh, was extremely efficient. And, you know, he looked at it like a physicist. And at one point, he even went back to Einstein and says, how can you be so sure it only takes one photon? And Einstein's response was, well, that's a lot. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but the problem was that, uh, you know, when other people measured it, they saw that uh, indeed it, it seemed to be that, that more photons were, were required and that there were actually multiple steps in photosynthesis that Warburg hadn't really understood when he first made this hypothesis. But Warburg, rather than seeing that, you know, people were building on, on his idea and clarifying it, just could not accept any correction whatsoever. So he lashed out and, and got into this, you know, massive scientific feud, which he was ultimately wrong about. Um, but, um, you know, that, that was his greatest flaw, which was, you know, more pronounced in the post-war period is that, um, he, he could not admit he was wrong about anything. And it, it became, you know, particularly in the realm of photosynthesis, it became an embarrassment for him and, and the cancer realm, you know, he sort of, I think he was ultimately right on the big questions, but he fought so hard on the smaller questions that he ended up undermining his reputation in a way that I think set cancer science back. Um, he was obnoxious, wasn't he? Because uh, he applied for a grant and uh, his grant application letter just was basically two, two lines. I need uh, this much money and that's it. <laughs> yeah, know? that's another classic Warburg. He like you know, a two sentence grant proposal, you know, like, uh, as you said, and, um, and, but he got it, you know, he got the money. He got uh, the money. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly his personality. And also I thought he was obnoxious when he uh, engaged in an open debate with two other scientists, American scientists who had opposing views. And uh, 
it looked like the American scientists had actually won the debate, but he came out yeah. of it and he published it everywhere and he told everyone he defeated them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, you know, in his, in his last years, he was really, you know, making some extreme claims. And I think, you know, he was getting older. I think that was part of it. Um, but, um, you know, part of it, uh, you know, as I've said before, it's just he could not admit he was wrong. But what's interesting is, you know, when he wasn't talking about himself, he could make all the right kind of statements. He would say that, you know, theories don't really matter. What matters is what you can demonstrate with evidence and that you shouldn't be attached to your theories because, you know, ultimately, you know, they just follow what your findings. But in, in reality, when it came to his own work, he became, you know, obsessed with the theories and, and wouldn't give up on them. Uh, so it's a shame because I think he had a lot of perspective and insight, you know, with respect to other scientists, but could not, you know, when it came to his own science, uh, you know, he just didn't have that perspective. And, and that's, of course, you know, to some extent true of everybody. But in, in his case, the distinction was, was all the more pronounced. It's... Um... Uh, you describe how he attended that symposium where he was going to face or debate, I think it was photosynthesis with, in Strasbourg, where he was going to debate photosynthesis with uh, his American counterparts. And uh, he was uh, 81 at the time. And uh, he was, uh, he came all posh and that's a British expression. So he was uh, very well dressed and he had a, 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 yeah, um, a big beautiful... <laughs> Yeah, big cowboy hat and a nice suit, cream colored suit. So I love your description of him when he attended that symposium. Yeah, I, I think in the, that's when I said in the book that he had gone full diva. Like, he, you know, he, he was wearing a cowboy hat. He was showing up in a chauffeur. Like, you just couldn't mess with him at that point. You know, he would get on stage. Like, he went to one symposium of Nobel Prize winners. He got up on stage with a few charts and said, this is all you need to know about cancer. Everything else is garbage. And then he you know, sort of walks off the stage, you know, what we call a mic drop now. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's kind of funny, but it's also a shame because, you know, his ideas were so important and, and people stopped taking him seriously, you know, when he started doing these things. Um, I think there was uh, an offer or a proposal, uh, this is post-war, to him to set up another a brand new institute when his institute was taken over. Um, uh, I can't, can't recall now who uh, made the proposal, but his response was, I've solved the mystery of cancer, so there's no, uh, no yeah. need for an institute. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that was another incredible line. In, in the 50s, they you know, they talked about, or, you know, somebody else within the Max Planck Society, you know, had looked into this idea of starting a new cancer institute, and Warburg's response was, you know, I've done it already, you know, what are we going to study? I've already figured it all out. Uh, but I, I think he was too old at that point, you know, I think, you know, maybe some part of him recognized that, um, you know, he was not going to be able to make the type of discoveries he had made earlier in life. But towards, I think, in the last decade or two of his life, he did make um, significant cont uh, contributions to science, yeah. think, especially when he wrote about the enzymes. I've got all of that yeah. in my yeah. notes. Uh, the aldolase was, was one. He discovered an important yeah. enzyme, the aldolase. Um, and, uh, you know, he talked about coenzymes and his work about coenzymes. Uh, nearly um, uh, sort of uh, nearly uh, brought him close to uh, uh, second second Nobel Prize, which never, yeah. never really yeah. never received yeah. it. I, I think he deserved three Nobel Prizes. You know, one, the first one for cancer, the second one for respiration, and the third one for his work on coenzyme. I think he, he truly deserved three, and I, I'm sure he would agree, <laughs> agree with me on that. And it was all within a relatively short period, you know, this period from the early 1920s into, you know, the mid to late 30s is when he did his greatest work. And he was really, you know, just revolutionizing biochemistry. And, and many people actually think his work on coenzymes was his most valuable contribution or his most, you know, remarkable research. And, you know, again, to this day, the, you know, the type of reactions that he focused on and, and how coenzymes and, and NAD function in, in a cell is, you know, a very hot area of interest. So, he deserves a lot of credit for that as well. And, you know, one irony that I pointed out in the book is that Warburg, you know, wanted 
to make a great discovery that would save lives. And in fact, you know, his his work actually led to new discoveries with vitamins that, uh, you know, cured pellagra and other diseases. So he really did do what he set out to do, but I don't think he ever really realized it. I think he was the first to, to discover the molecule nic nicotinamide uh, niacin with vitamin B3. So uh, he, ha he has some significant work yeah, yeah, no, uh, in that point. field. He never, he never got awarded the second Nobel Prize. Yeah, I mean, he, he claimed that he didn't get it only because Hitler had said nobody, no Germans would accept the Nobel Prize, but I didn't find evidence to really support that claim. Uh, it is certainly possible that they didn't bother to give it to him knowing that, but I didn't find evidence supporting Warburg's statement that they were about to give it to him and then had to, to take it back. Um, so he was working until his death. Yeah. He actually couldn't have chosen a better um, place to end his life <laughs> than yeah. his own lab. Yeah. Can you tell us yeah. more about that, how he died? Yeah, well, he, um, you know, the, the sort of key event that uh, led to his death was he was climbing up a ladder in his library and, and reaching for a book and he slipped and, and fell. And to me, that was, you know, such kind of a, a poignant and symbolic way for, for Warburg to reach the end, you know, sort of climbing, reaching for more knowledge and then ending up, you know, flat on the ground in his institute. Um, you know, that's a, it's an image uh, that has stayed in my head and what you know, makes it all the more fitting in a way is that nobody came to help him because they were afraid to come into his library. He used that as his office. And so he just lay there uh, alone without help for some time. And, um, you know, he did recover from that and, and live for, I forget, around another year. Uh, but uh, that was sort of the beginning of, of the end and, and the, what I kind of think of as his death. And when, when I went to the library, um, you know, there's a little placard on, on the third step of the ladder, which, you know, shows where he slipped. And, um, you know, just like, you know, the other thing is that in his library, you know, he had picked three paintings on the wall, Robert Koch, uh, Pasteur and Ehrlich. And these were, you know, the three great scientists that had changed the world. And, uh, you know, he saw himself as the fourth in this, in this line. And, um, you know, that was really where, where, all the symbols came together with Warburg lying on the floor before these men. What a poignant <laughs> way to die. Yeah. And you mentioned that he and no one uh, discovered that he would, he'd slipped because the curtains were closed. And when the curtains were closed, it meant that he didn't want to be disturbed and he was uh, doing serious work. Right, right. But everyone yeah. probably left him alone. Yeah, so they did, you know, after a while, somebody came in, you know, and found him, but, um, you know, it's, it probably wouldn't have made a difference in terms of how long he survived, but it is, you know, this man who was so arrogant that, you know, his arrogance ultimately, you know, it's like a morality tale, his arrogance ultimately led him to, to lie there alone and be isolated from the world. So it's, it's a striking image, I think. Also striking in terms of how he led his life because he really isolated himself from everyone else. He yeah. had no intention of making friends. Uh, that wasn't in his uh, agenda. In fact, he alienated other scientists by, yeah. uh, by directly attacking them or talking unkindly of them in some of the papers he published. Yeah, yeah, it got to the point where it was almost a compliment to be insulted by Warburg. It was like a <laughs> rite of passage for a young scientist. Uh, but, um, you know, he was, he had Heiss, he had a few other scientists that he liked. He liked Hans Krebs and, uh, a few others, but, um, you know, they called him the emperor of Dalam, the Kaiser of Dalam. That's his neighborhood in, in Berlin. You know, he would ride around on his horse and live like a king and, you know, kings don't need that many friends. They have their, their helpers and, uh, it, um, you know, it's just his personality. People have asked me in other interviews, like, how did he end up this way? I, I personally think he was just born that way. You know, like, you can't, you can't create somebody with that personality. And Mike, you do refer to him as a narcissist in your book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, um, I'm sure it was encouraged by different trends and by, you know, growing up among Nobel Prize winners, but ultimately he was born a narcissist, I believe. Um, yes. 
he probably yeah, was but, because yeah. he meets all the criteria. <laughs> yeah. But when the, the fascinating thing for me is that I feel like usually when you see somebody with that personality, they're not also incredibly brilliant. He, I would think of those two things as being in contradiction. I think he's among the rare narcissists who is also truly a genius. Yes, he was. Um, um, so he was, I think, for, for, for a little while, perhaps, you know, 10, 20 years, his theory was forgotten. The world didn't even mention, it, mention him in um, cancer books. In fact, some of the cancer books uh, published in the 70s did not even mention Warburg's name. And um, I was actually intrigued to find out it was um, uh, Thomas uh, Seyfried, uh, Seyfried the, that uh, brought him back to life, that gave, gave him the credit that he deserves. Yeah, I mean, Seyfried definitely played, played a role in that. Um, you know, there were some others as well, but yeah, it's one of the most remarkable things is how dramatically Warburg fell off the map in, in mainstream. I mean, there were always people more on the fringes who remained interested, but in mainstream cancer science, uh, you know, in the post-war period for, for several decades, he just vanished. Um, you know, you look at um, all these papers, the seminal paper, the hallmarks of cancer, which describes, you know, these six key features of what cancer cells do. It doesn't mention metabolic alterations of cancer cells, you know, which is so fundamental. Uh, you know, this famous textbooks that comes out in 2006 by Robert Weinberg also wrote the Hallmarks of Cancer or co-wrote it. The textbook doesn't mention Warburg. You have The Emperor of All Maladies, a very fascinating, well-written book, but doesn't mention Warburg. Uh, you know, scientists who wanted to study metabolic changes in cancer cells, you know, really had very little outlet. You know, no one wanted to publish articles about that. And so it returned into the mainstream only in the late 90s. You know, at the time, everybody was interested almost entirely in oncogenes, and they were trying to understand how these cancer-causing genes work. And they started to see that they actually work, or some of the key ones work, by controlling metabolic processes. So there's, a, there's the synthesis. And um, you know, a lot of these scientists like Chi Van Dang and Matthew Vanderheiden and Craig Thompson and Lewis Cantley that I talked about in my book brought this stuff back from the fringes into the mainstream and, um, you know, really set off a, a, a sort of modern, what I call a Warburg revival. Sam, so I have another 10 minutes. I know we're over an hour now. Would you like a drink or do you like to take a break? Yeah, um, yeah I'll, take, I'll take another, I'll pour myself a little more to drink. Okay, that sounds great. And thank you, by the way, I, I've done a lot of interviews, but I don't, I don't think anybody has asked me such specific questions about the history and a lot of some of the stuff I had almost forgotten about. So I thank you for reading it so closely and asking such good questions. Well, you see my um, uh, linguistics background. So yeah. <laughs> linguistics background. So it's in my nature. I couldn't just scan through it. I had to read everything. I had to take I, notes. I, I had to yeah. highlight. That's that's the only way I can read a book. Yeah. Otherwise... Yeah, it's, it's, it's very gratifying for an author to see that somebody has read so closely. All right. Now, at some point throughout Warburg's life, scientists were able to identify sugar specifically as being the culprit in the Western diet that's causing cancer. Any comments on that? Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that was and, and remains controversial, but, um, you know, going back, you know, even to, um, you know, very early 20th century, uh, you know, people were seeing that uh, sugar and, and, you know, refined carbohydrates were responsible for obesity. Gary Taubes has written a lot about this. And uh, a number of people did, in fact, point out that, uh, you know, sugar in particular seemed to be linked to cancer in terms of, um, you know, just epidemiology studies. They didn't have any evidence in terms of what's happening biologically, but they could see that populations that tended to eat a lot of sugar, you know, had more obesity, more diabetes, and eventually they saw that cancer was a part of this too. And, and so that it was always a suspicion uh, and carbohydrates in particular, you know, sugar is of course one type of carbohydrates, but they, you know, in feeding studies of mice and um, other rodents, they had been able to, to see that uh, carbohydrates were linked to cancer, but it, it was all very unclear. You know, I, I think 
you couldn't make a conclusive case about sugar in particular in the first part of the 20th century. And it became more clear, you know, in the second part of the 20th century, partially because the epide epidemiology continued, but um, partially because, you know, we got this extremely important clue at the end of the 20th century about the link between obesity and cancer. So now, you know, whatever causes obesity, I think you can fairly say causes cancer and that, that sugar is linked to obesity, I think is not controversial. Um, yes, you do mention that. It was very clear that there is a direct link between, um, between sugar and diabetes or a high carbohydrate diet and diabetes. But the link, although it was known that there was a link, but it wasn't as clear between uh, the link between um, you know, our diet or sugar and cancer. That link was not as clear and they couldn't explain it, but they could yeah. identify that there was a link. But yeah. even, even as early as the 1900s, uh, they ran a number of studies on mice and they found that mice who developed cancer had higher or elevated um, glucose levels. Yeah, it, it's, you know, it, it's very, this is one of the, the real challenges of the book is, is explaining and understanding all of this because, um, you know, there's many different layers to the story. Warburg discovered that a cancer cell takes up a lot of glucose. And then we do these studies, you know, carbohydrates, of course, break down to glucose. So we think, you know, simply if you eat a lot of glucose, then cells will get more glucose and they'll get more cancer. But it's not necessarily that simple. You have, for example, you know, many Asian populations eating a ton of rice and not, not getting cancer. So then we have to look at, you know, is it all carbohydrates or certain carbohydrates in the diet? that are particularly dangerous. And when I say sugar, I mean, not, you know, glucose, which is also unfortunately sometimes just referred to as sugar, but, but specifically uh, the molecule sucrose, which is one half glucose and one half fructose. And that combination seems to be uniquely bad. And when you mix that into a diet, then suddenly all carbohydrates tend to lead to these underlying metabolic abnormalities, you know, insulin resistance first and foremost. And that's, I think the process by which, you know, all these problems arise. So it's important to make these distinctions. And it's an unfortunate that uh, we tend to use the same word sugar for these different types of carbohydrates. But when I say in ravenous that I think, you know, sugar is uniquely harmful. What I'm really talking about is it's the sweet white stuff, the sucrose. Uh, I think that if you never ate sucrose, you could probably you know, eat a lot of certain types of carbohydrates and still, you know, be relatively healthy. What fascinated me, I know this isn't about cancer, it's about diabetes, was that, and you do mention it in your book, was that the uh, American uh, Diabetes Association recommended that diabetics um, eat uh, fructose, <laughs> Uh, but avoid glucose, which was the evil tw twin of fructose. Yeah. But they recommended that everyone eat fructose because, because yeah. of course, fructose doesn't uh, uh, doesn't cause um, elevation, uh, blood sugar elevation in the same way as yeah. glucose would. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's exactly right. And um, you know, I, I can see how they. I mean, it's incredibly unfortunate, but you can see how they made the mistake because you know, if you just think in terms of blood sugar, then you take the fructose, as you said, and it, you know, it seems to be relatively benign, you know, a lot of it is going, ending up in the liver. What they didn't understand is that it's ending up in the liver and it's producing liver fat and that's causing the insulin resistance. And it's the insulin that's then getting elevated and driving more glucose into the cells. So, um, you know, they, they missed it really. <laughs> that's what it comes down to. Uh, and they're still, you know, many people to this day are, are still missing this part of the story. You know, it's not, I don't think, well understood even in, in the medical world. Well, I'm very passionate about diabetes because I'm type one diabetic myself. Uh, you mentioned there's just one sentence in the book where you do mention type one diabetes. And I went, yay, thank you for that. Thank you for mentioning us because we are here too, we exist. So, uh, so it's very pleased. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think that I was just gonna say that, you know, a lot of this stuff that I'm interested in, in terms of low carbohydrate nutrition, I mean, it's been, extraordinary for type one diabetics and being able to use much less insulin on these diets. I, and I think it's really incredible. Yes, because they were talking about insulin. They, they were actually questioning whether cancer was caused by elevated uh, levels of blood sugar or whether it was the elevated levels of insulin. And we still have that question. I mean, we're still asking that question and trying to find answers. Mm -hmm. 
so it was yeah. fascinating that yeah. you know even 30 years ago they yeah. were um they'd identified insulin as the possible uh cause and, and yeah. now, now i think we know now the science is more sort of solid about that we know that hyperinsulinemia causes um and it's not necessarily your blood sugar, but hyperinsulinemia causes uh, at least certain types of cancer, including breast yeah. cancer and prostate cancer. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I personally, you know, think it's, you know, it's the key, the key takeaway from Ravenous, in my opinion, is that we are missing the hyperinsulinemia story. Not, not that we don't know about it, but that it doesn't have enough focus in our society. You know, you think about glucose in our blood there's always glucose in the blood you die if there there wasn't you know as, as you know as, a, as a, a type 1 diabetic um so the question is you know how are cells getting that glucose and you need insulin you know to take that glucose up and you know generally speaking and um you know the body is really designed you know is, is insulin you know parsing parsing out these nutrients and if a cell is able to get more insulin because it has more insulin receptors or because it has a genetic mutation and this PI3K pathway that allows it to get more insulin, it's gonna have a growth advantage. And, you know, it's not gonna die. It's gonna continue to get this, you know, this signal from insulin to stay alive and thrive. And um, we know that insulin drives obesity, of course. So, you know, I think the underlying story is not necessarily that obesity is causing these cancers, but that insulin is driving simultaneously obesity and cancer. Yes. So, uh, yeah, insulin is a much needed hormone. Um, yeah, no, my body no. doesn't make it. So uh, I have to wear an insulin pump to get yeah. the insulin. But the question is, how much insulin does one need to survive? So do we just uh, need a basal level of insulin or do we need a lot more than that? And I think it's the amount of insulin generated by the body that's that's causing these problems. It's not the insulin, the hormone uh, per se. Um and that's something I, I, I'm, I'm worried about. I'm scared about overdoing, overusing insulin. Um, I want to maintain good blood sugars, obviously. Um, yeah. I want to uh, keep myself alive. I have to take my insulin, but I don't want to overdo it because it's not like I can't take it like candy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's... resistant eventually. So, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you know, what's upsetting is you know, you clearly have this knowledge, but yeah, you know, many people are, are getting diagnosed with uh, type one or type two diabetes and being told, you know, just eat whatever you want and take your insulin. That, you know, that's what's upsetting that, you know, even though we now have this knowledge that that message, you know, still being given to patients. Sam, our channel is called Low Carb and Fasting. Now we did talk about the uh, importance of low carbohydrate nutrition, about avoiding uh, sugar, <laughs> specifically sucrose. We talked about insulin. What are your thoughts about fasting or intermittent uh, fasting? Yeah, I, I don't, um, I feel like uh, it, you know, <laughs> It's too soon to say for sure. I think um, you know, and I've seen the latest studies, and that that don't provide you know obvious advantage uh, for people that are you know doing this intermittent fasting. But I also know that there's some problems with those studies. Uh, what is clear to me is that in, in rodent studies of cancer, it does seem to to show an advantage to intermittent fasting. So I remain optimistic that it's going to be shown to be, you know, demonstrated to be a very helpful tool for some people. I certainly know anecdotally many people who were doing low carb were not making enough progress and then added in intermittent fasting and then sort of were able to get over the, the threshold and do better. So it's uh, worth mentioning here that Thomas Seafried, for example, uses uh, not only ketogenic diet, he has his own protocol, obviously, but but also fasting. Yeah. Um, as a treatment for uh, for cancer, and is that some success stories which were yeah. published online? Well, I can not thank you enough for making the time for uh, for us today. Yeah, no, I, I want to thank you and thank you for reading the book so closely and for asking such good questions. Before we uh, before we uh, say bye, can you remind our audience? How they can purchase the book and also where they can find you on on, uh, on social media. 
Uh, sure, the book should be available wherever books are sold, uh, I would hope. Uh, you can certainly find it uh, online at Amazon and other online bookshops. And um, I'm somewhat active on Twitter at, uh, at uh, Sam underscore Apple one. And my website is samapple.com. And uh, I'm always happy to hear from readers. And you're also on Instagram, Sam Apple Books. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm bad at Instagram. Don't look at that. <laughs> you are on Instagram, Sam Apple Books. Uh, finding people, follow him, support him. Thank you very much, Sam. Have Thanks. a good day. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye.